Anyway, I would really, really like to introduce uh, Craig McBride, who's our next speaker. Um, he is a pediatric surgeon in Brisbane, and he says one of the greatest perks about living in Brisbane is that every winter he gets to remind uh, his local colleagues that the greatest rugby team in the world wears a black jersey. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not going to even get into that. But uh, Craig's going to talk to us about his top five pediatric surgical papers. I was thinking about um, Susie's paper, and I wonder how many of you wondered where they found the control surgeons for that paper. <laughs> so we'll, we'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. I, I'm a paediatric surgeon, and I represent 50% of the paediatric surgeons in this room. My knowledge <laughs> is, is not the same as your knowledge, although there is some overlap. My silo is not the same as your silo, and my tribe is not always the same as your tribe. I'm a surgeon, so I don't follow the rules. This is my first paper. <laughs> I, I live in Brisbane. If you take a map of Australia and you superimpose it on a map of Europe, this is what it looks like. That's Queensland, which is the patient population that I draw from. And my centre, Brisbane, is somewhere in the middle of the western half of the Black Sea between Sebastopol and Odessa. There is another paediatric surgical unit in the Gold Coast, which is 100 kilometres south, so still in the Black Sea. And there's another paediatric surgical unit in Townsville, which for the Europeans in the audience is Minsk. Some of my patients live in Helsinki, and some of my patients live in Prague or Vienna, and we have to make decisions about how we're going to treat those patients, and we do that using telehealth. We have some experience, the last time we counted the numbers, over 20,000 telehealth public uh, consultations, and we've started to be able to extract what we can do justifiably, what we can do with accuracy via telehealth. And to date, we had thought that pretty much everything you can do face-to-face, -face, you can do with telehealth. We started off using telehealth for burns and the follow-up of burns patients and also the acute care of burns patients. And that's relatively easy because you can see what's going on it's at, at the surface. And then we extended it into vascular anomalies and then we extended it into paediatric surgery. And what we found was that we were pretty accurate for most things except for the undescended testis. And we had a, a short publication a few years ago just raising the question that perhaps we weren't quite so good at the assessment of the undescended testis. And what we were ending up doing was bringing a number of patients to Brisbane with a view to operating on them who, who turned out to have either normally descended testes or retractile testes not requiring an operation. And so we went back into the data set and asked ourselves, uh, is there anything we can do that will allow us to predict with more accuracy which patients we don't need to bring down? Recognising that if we bring everyone down for an assessment, send them back home and then bring them back again for an operation, that's a lot of travel for the family. The only thing we found is that those patients who are coming from larger centres that we're telehealthing to were more likely to need an operation, 59%, than those patients that were coming from very much smaller centres where only 17% of them were needing an operation. 83% of the time, the assessment was inaccurate by the clinician on the ground at the other end. And the only thing we could identify was that larger centres are more likely to have paediatricians in attendance. And perhaps, and we don't know yet, there is a point where the data end and the speculation begins, perhaps paediatricians are our eyes and ears on the ground. And that's really important because for every one of me, there are 27 of you in Australia. And it's not going to get any better because for every one of my trainees, there are 47 paediatric trainees 
I can't work the numbers out for paediatric emergency medicine, I'm sorry, because it's a bit harder to work out who's a PEM consultant and who's working as a PEM consultant but not necessarily badged as one. So that's my first paper, paper planes. My next paper is tissue paper. I work in burns and we see 1,300 new patients with a burn every year. And for all of those patients, their parents were there when it happened. Or for the majority of those patients, their parents were there when it happened. As a parent, you have one job. And that job is to look after your child and protect your child. And every parent in the world, when they know they're going to have a baby, writes a story for that baby. And those stories always have happy endings. And then something happens. And the story gets ripped apart and thrown in the bin. And you have to now write a new story, but you don't know what that story is going to be because your child has reached up onto the bench and pulled the cup of hot coffee down on them. Or your child has tumbled headfirst into the bucket of boiling water that you're using to mop the floor. We know, and Simon brought this up yesterday, how much time and effort do we spend thinking about what we're about to do to our patients? Data from our unit at the Peg Leditschke Children's Burn Centre in Brisbane shows that if you treat pain before a burns dressing properly, that will result in shorter healing times for children. Now, we kind of know that anecdotally anyway, but we've managed to demonstrate that scientifically. How much shorter... It's two to three days, so that's one dressing change, and it may be the difference between a burn that scars and a burn that doesn't scar on the outside. There are also scars on the inside. More recent data from our unit, building on that, all good research raises more questions than it answers. So, well, what about the parent? Because there is another player in that equation. Because children, we know, take their cues from their parents. We know that if children are stressed and or sore, they will heal more slowly. So what about that interaction between the parents? We now know, and there are a number of research students completing their PhDs or have completed their PhDs in the unit, who've looked at this question. Nadia Brown, Erin Brown, Alex DeYoung, Stephen Chester. Parents' stress response predicts a child's stress response. If the parents are exhibiting post-traumatic stress symptoms, if the parents have poor coping strategies, and if the parents feel guilty, that will directly impact upon the child's healing. What does that tell us? It tells us that everybody is part of the team here treating the patient. It's fashionable at the moment to talk about family-centred care, care, but here's a scientific reason that family-centred care is actually really important. If we can treat the parent, they all feel guilty. If they didn't, that would be more concerning. If we treat the parent, we can actually help the child to heal more rapidly. How do we do that? We do that by all being part of the same team. Now, you have to put an all-black picture in a talk as a New Zealander involving Australians. It's happened once today already. This is the second time. The All Blacks have a 77% career winning strategy. Now, in the last 10 years, it's approaching 90%. Every year, by the way, there is a competition between the All Blacks and the Wallabies for the Bledisloe Cup. And I know that not a single Australian has ever tweeted or put up on Facebook, we've won the Bledisloe Cup. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the last time it happened, neither of those had been invented. <laughs> we all have to be part of the same team and we all have to be part of the same messaging to the family. Because if one person goes off message then the parents can pick up on that. Parents are all feeling guilty and we all need to work to assuage that guilt. The all-black mantra for that is sweep the shed. The all-blacks are famous 
for always tidying up after themselves. And the mantra they use is sweep the shed, clean out the changing rooms after we've left. Changing rooms are always spotless after the All Blacks leave. And, and, it, and it's a mantra that says no one person is more important than the team. I'm a surgeon in the Burns unit, but I'm just the surgeon in the Burns unit. I don't do occupational therapy, I don't do nursing, I'm not very good at putting dressings on. I'm a part of the team and the whole team needs to be on message. That's tissue paper. We live in a world where truth is less important than traction now. And what you say and how loudly you say it is now dissociated from truth. And the more important you are perceived to be, the more important your message is perceived to be. And you can say things that get reported in the media that just simply aren't true. People are entitled to their own opinions. They're not entitled to their own facts. My third paper is newspaper. And with very little fanfare, on the 3rd of June, the Fairfax Media, which is one of the two big media conglomerates in Australia, published a manifesto. It's a self determined manifesto about how they will report science or medicine in the media from now on. Now the world of the newspaper seems to have been split into an attempt to define on the one hand everything that causes cancer and an attempt to define on, on the other hand everything that cures cancer. The Fairfax media which represent these papers which are large dailies in Australia, they have de decided that they will no longer report scientific breakthroughs based on a press release or a push poll or a small sample. That where it's an animal study, they will report that it's an animal study. They will no longer use words like miraculous or cure or guaranteed. And they will seek independent opinion on the fully published paper, not on the press release, not on the abstract. I think that's amazing. Newspaper. Recycled paper is my next paper. And it's come up a little bit this morning already about the dangers of continuing to do the things that we've always done in the face of evidence that it may not be the best thing anymore. Necrotizing enterocolitis is something that challenges surgeons. When you look at this photograph, you can tell how small the baby is by looking at the size of my hands. I wear a size seven and a half glove. That's not a particularly large hand, but that's a very small baby. And what you're looking at there is NEC totalis. It's a sick baby. I've opened the abdomen and all of the gut's dead. So I now have to tell that family that their baby will die. There is no other alternative. Anything we can do to prevent that is good. If you, taking off your clinician's hats for a second and putting on a parent hat, if you had a small child, a 26-weeker that weighed under a kilogram in the neonatal intensive care unit and someone said, we want to give breast milk rather than formula, how many would say yes, please, for their baby? Great, okay. If they said, we want to give probiotics, how many would say yes? Smaller number. If they said, we would like, small number, not quite so sure, if they said, we would like to enrol your child in a randomised controlled trial, <coughs> placebo controlled trial, comparing probiotics with no probiotics, how many would be okay with having their child enrolled in that trial? Be brave. Okay. This is a cumulative meta-analysis published last year. It's a rolling meta-analysis, so as each new paper comes in, the meta-analysis gets redone. Looking at probiotics versus placebo for the prevention of NEC. Now how many of you would be happy to have your child enrolled? There's, there's many, many... So I sit on an ethics committee, and I would have a great deal of trouble allowing many of these trials. The earliest one is 1986, but I would argue that by about 2006, 7, maybe 8, the answer is relatively clear. 
and it becomes more difficult to sustain that as you move down. Now, many of these, these are, there are issues with all of this. Many of these papers are from areas of the world where NEC is very, very common. Almost none of them look at the downsides of probiotic administration, but the challenge here is from something like this, is if you are going to propose a randomised controlled trial, particularly one that involves a placebo, I would argue that it behooves you to make sure that the question hasn't already been addressed to your satisfaction in the literature. The concept of equipoise came up this morning and I think that's really, really important. Because we're all working for the same goal. Let's recycle paper. My last paper deals with perspective. This is Uluru as rock from above. It looks a bit different to the way most people expect to see it. This is not the Australian outback. This is sandpaper. <laughs> okay. And that's my second sledge. <laughs> Susie's talked about this a little bit. Uh, sandpaper just quietly wears away at things over time. It's sometimes used to gain an unfair advantage. The Royal Australasian College of Surgeons in 2015 realised that it had a problem. It had a problem with bullying. And they did a survey. They sent a survey out to all surgeons registered in Australia, 7,000 surgeons, and 50% responded to the survey, which is pretty good for a survey of surgeons. Surgeons and trainees. And 50% of those people had experienced harassment, bullying or intimidation. That was published in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Surgery and it was published with an editorial that apologised for that behaviour by the president of the college. And the college has embarked upon a concerted, deliberate and very public effort to expunge bullying, harassment and intimidation from and by surgeons. And no one expects that that will change overnight, but change is starting to come. I don't for a moment expect that surgeons are, or surgery is any different really <coughs> from other specialties. I suspect there's bullying in other specialties. I've worked as a paediatric medical registrar. People have harassed and attempted to intimidate me while I was doing that. I've worked as a neonatal intensive care registrar and the same things happened. The difference perhaps, and Oscar Wilde maybe said this best, true friends stab you in the front. And by that definition, perhaps that means that surgeons are your true friends. <laughs> <laughs> but, but ask yourself this question. I, there is banter, which we all do at times. As you move along the spectrum, it can become sledging. And then as you move a bit further, it might be intimidation or bullying or harassment. It's happened here at Don't Forget the Bubbles with respect to surgery and directed at surgeons. I'll call it out. Kim said yesterday, you have three choices. You can walk away you can hunker down or you can do something about it. It's important. We just need to be kind to each other. We need to get away from the casual tribalism that exists. It is contagious, as Susie says. The easiest person to call out, I think, is yourself. As a surgeon, I exist in a position of authority and I am expected, by and large, to be a bit of a bully and to be a bit intimidating and to be a bit harassing. And those of you that say, oh, that's not true, lots of you laughed at the beginning of my talk. Maybe it's time for that tribalism to end.
Thank you so much, Craig. That was also pretty awesome. There's quite a lot on Twitter. I don't know if Ian's still got the microphone as well. So why don't we start with some Twitter and also if we have some hands up, if you've got any questions. Uh, yeah, we've got s loads and loads of stuff that's come through on Twitter. Um, there's a really great question from Angharad Spencer Matawer. Sorry, I'm not pronouncing that right. Um, who asks about telemedicine. Um, she says um, she wonders if it translates to African settings where distance and cost of access might be prohibitive. Um, she says they're starting to use neurosurgery in rural Malawi, and could that be uh, expanded elsewhere? That's a really good question, and it, 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 there's a couple of answers. The, it depends <coughs> what you're using telehealth for. So if you're using telehealth for opinion and discussion, then the, 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 um, the size of your bandwidth doesn't need to be that high because the integrity of what you're looking at doesn't have to be that great. If you're using it for direct patient care, you need enough bandwidth to be able to see what you want to be looking at. Most, much of the research has been done in Australia and in Canada in paediatric surgery because the geographies of the two countries are quite similar. Um, but there's, there's no reason that I can think of other than what I've just said why it wouldn't easily translate to other countries. Paediatric surgeons are rare beasts and they exist in major cities by definition. We need neonatal intensive care units to make our life interesting. <laughs> um, and so there's always that problem of what happens to children that don't live in major cities who have paediatric surgical conditions. But yeah, it, it translates. And it can translate internationally as well. I've telehealthed internationally. There's a, there's a potential issue of licensing, but care of the patient comes first, I would argue. Brilliant, thank you. What else is on the Twitter sphere? Um, not so much a question, but there's loads of people who've really picked up on what you said about um, managing pain before dressing injury, before changing dressing for burns uh, patients. So that's something that's clearly got a lot of traction, and I think um, a lot of people are going to incorporate that into their practice. So thank you very much, Craig. Anything in the room? Anyone would like to ask Craig? Yes, we've got one over here. Thank you. Um, Alice Downs from Leeds. Um, I just wondered, why are there so few paediatric surgeons? Because I think some of the, well, you don't say difficulties, but perhaps there's such a high workload and so few. But to me, paediatric surgeons can offer so much more than just the operation. And if there was more of them, then they would be able to give us the expertise that we haven't got. That, it's a really, it's a, it's an easy question to ask and a really difficult one to answer, and it's one that we've asked ourselves. Um, surgeons always think about operations, or surgical trainees particularly, and it becomes the kind of defining thing. If you're a surgical trainee, it's always about how many operations you have in your logbook. Uh, and each specialty has its marquee operations, and in paediatric surgery, those marquee operations are related to neonates by and large. There is a time coming, I, I think, and I don't know how much the view is shared by other people, that um, paediatric surgery may split and we may end up with surgeons who operate on children in centres that are smaller. Now, there, there are issues associated with that because how do you form a call roster? It's generally, it's generally accepted that you need 250 to 350,000 children per surgeon to sustain a practice. Um, and then if you're going to train those surgeons, do you, how do you train surgeons for perhaps smaller centres? Do you do, you do a, a full paediatric surgical fellowship recognising that some of the more major stuff they're never going to do because they'll be in larger centres? Or do you split and do you have paediatric surgeons and neonatal surgeons who exist in the, the larger ones. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's a question that we'll have to address, but we haven't yet. We've, that's sparked some interesting thoughts. We've got two more questions down here. Microphone on the way. <laughs> I've got a big voice. Um, so just following on from that comment, I think in the UK we're already seeing this. I work in a district general hospital, and our surgeons have been pushing back 
um, because the paediatric surgical training is split. Um, so you can enter after your FY2 foundation years into your paediatric surgical run through and that's all you do. And then the general surgeons don't really do any paediatric surgery really. And so now we're seeing the newer consultants coming through who are kind of saying, well, we don't really do kids. So our age of being able to do things in a DGH has shifted from we don't do under twos to now we don't do under sixes. And now people are saying we don't want to do under eight. Um, and this is becoming a real issue for us. How, how do we navigate these problems and the differences between different, different local hospitals? In, in Australia, there are hospitals that don't do under 14s. Mm. And, and I, there, there, is, there is no difference between a 13-year-old appendix and a 15-year-old yeah. appendix in terms of the, the operative technique. There may be some differences in terms of how you look after those people afterwards. And we'd like to think that we would do a better job as paediatric surgeons. But equally, you, you can be 17 and rock up to my hospital and need your gallbladder out. And I probably, I, I don't do as good a job as an adult hospital would at doing that. It's not an operation that I do very commonly, but that's, that's an ordinary operation for those surgeons. Um, as you define yourselves as a specialty, you, you tend to bring more and more to yourself, which means that people outside yourself, your non-tribe, get less exposure to it and therefore more discomfort. Um, and we need, we need to be having conversations with people rather than push and push back. In, in Brisbane, where I work, the, the hospitals that are close to us are more comfortable referring to us. The hospitals that are further away from us are more comfortable holding on to those children, recognising that that's less of a dislocation for their family. And those hospitals are staffed by people who have maintain those skills. If you get to larger, more specialised adult hospitals, that, that's not their skill set because their skill set lies somewhere else. Thank you. So uh, we've got one more question here and then I might call the surgical questions to an end and then we can continue on Twitter because there's stuff coming through from everywhere now. Um, just one point leading on from Alice's thing. I think it was more, less to do with the surgery and more to do with the expertise and knowledge. Um, do you think there's a place, therefore, for advanced practitioners coming through to actually provide that expert knowledge rather than just specifically focusing on the surgeries. Um, being an advanced practitioner in A&E, it, it would be helpful to have that specialist knowledge, not necessarily needing the operation there and then, but that knowledge that you guys have that we don't necessarily know about in that area. Yeah, so that's, that's the American system. That's what they do there. They have um, <laughs> nurse practitioners in paediatric surgery. So in... La, you know, the, the biggest, so Cincinnati Children's, second best, and that's an official title, second best children's hospital in the United States after Boston and before CHOP. Um, they have nurse practitioners in paediatric surgery. So they, they do a whole lot of that stuff. So, yeah, but there's a, there's a mental jump that has to happen for that to, for that to occur in the UK and in Australia and New Zealand. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much, Craig. And there really is a lot coming through on the Twitter sphere. So please do keep your questions coming and we'll retweet. And I'm sure, hopefully, I, I don't want to promise, but hopefully Craig will be able to answer some more of those online.